Богдан Ловко, магістерка програми з журналістики. Скажіть, будь ласка, наскільки ви знайомі з українським кінематографом? І якщо так, то які ваші враження? There are wonderful films coming out, we know for a long time, but wonderful films coming out of China, for example. People always want to make films because they want to express something about their world and about themselves and about their reaction to their world. And the good thing about, if I might call it, European filmmaking, especially this part of the world, is that Hollywood is a dream over there. And there's nothing to do with that. I, for example, I once went to a meeting, uh, not so long ago actually, where uh, a wonderful, uh, with a friend of mine who'd written a, a, a wonderful novel, um, and he was being offered a, a lot of money uh, for the rights to this novel by a Hollywood company. And he asked me to go with him to the meeting with the producer. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a grand novel. I mean, it doesn't take place in a, in a room. It's a, an, a, 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 an epic novel. So we had this very serious conversation with this producer, where he said, you know, this was the producer who was offering huge sums of money. And um, eventually, uh, the writer, looking at me, he said to the producer, he said, what, what do you think, uh, what budget do you have in mind for this film? Now, if, if, he, if he'd asked that question to me, and I was going to direct the film, given that it was an epic film, I might have said, well, because it's a huge film and we need one or two big stars, probably $10 million. So just keep that figure in mind. So, in the, the straight face, the writer asked the Hollywood producer, what, what budget do you have in mind? And he said, I have a gut feeling about this budget. Not a gut feeling. In my stomach, I have a gut feeling. So, so we knew there was an interesting answer coming. He said, I see it as 200 million. That was the end of the conversation. We left because that's not real filmmaking. I mean, if you're trying to do something like Avatar, then you need 200 million because it's a huge experiment, but James Cameron has earned 200 million, so he can spend 200 million. But for a beginner filmmaker, or a filmmaker in the Ukrainian context, you would never think that. And that's good. That's good. But it begs the question, why do people want to make films? I never know the answer to that. I'm from that Peter now. I never know the answer to that. I, I used to, I don't anymore. I go around a lot of, I used to, as I've said, go, not a lot, but quite a number of film festivals. And in the film festivals, you will see 50 wonderful films. You go to the next film festival, and you'll see exactly the same 50 wonderful films. Big audience, never seen again. Film will go round the festival circuit and have very interesting, very enthusiastic reviews. And the director thinks this is wonderful. People love my film. Never seen again. 
that's the future for many filmmakers. You know, they'll make a film which they had to sell their house to finance, uh, they've had to beg uh, an actor to take part in, etc., etc., etc. The government has given them money, shown at a film festival, wins an award, never seen again. So why do people want to do that? I don't know. Ще три наступні запитання, і ми будемо закінчувати нашу зустріч. Мене звати Іра, канал «Новин-24». Вам два коротенькі питання. Перше, чи були у вас якісь проекти, ідеї, які не географічні, які ви з тих чи інших причин не реалізували, а ви хотіли б до них повернутися, можливо, зараз? І друге питання, чи чули ви про фільм 32-го року, Тода Браунінга, який називається «The Freaks» – «Виробки». Це фільм про людей, які мали якісь психологічні або фізичні відхилення і які працювали в певний період в цирку. І він показав їхню важку долю. Фільм був заборонений впродовж 30 років. Як ви ставитеся до таких фільмів? Дякую. Answering the first part of your question first, did I have projects that failed? Hundreds. Hundreds. If not thousands. I couldn't find the money. Uh, I couldn't see how to do it. I couldn't convince myself that I was good enough to do it. Hundreds of people. Many, 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 many. I now have planned in my mind about another 20 films. I think the chances are I'll make three or four of them for the same reason. Got to find the money, got to work out how to do it, do I want to do it, you know, just things like that. Uh, the second part of the question about freaks. Uh, I'm against any form of censorship. Uh, I, I have absolutely no idea. I mean, you can get it now in, in England. I have no idea why that film is banned. I've seen it, actually. It's an interesting film. Interesting film. Um, and, of course, the more it is banned, the more its reputation goes up. But I'm absolutely against any kind of, of censorship. I, I think with... I think with the internet we have to be careful. We have to be careful, I speak to small children of my own, we have to be careful what we allow them to see. And that's not sensitive, that's just being careful. Parental guidance. Um, that's very, very important, I think. Uh, I saw a very interesting statistic the other day, that when the internet really began to get going in the, the mid-90s, uh, the percentage of, of um, pornography that was watched was something like 68% of every access to the internet was pornography. 68%. Last year, it was 21%. That's no censorship. See, people get bored. I'm sorry to say, once you've seen one, you've seen them all. So people think, well, what's the point? Down they come. And I think, you know, if you had, uh, I mean, we have a free, what well, we in England, I think you do, have a free press. Unfortunately, I do not see revolution on the streets of London. I'd quite like to see revolution on the streets of London. But we have a free press. As you did here, I think. Uh, I mean, freedom of information. 
access to information never did any harm to anybody, except the politicians who don't want us to know. They will lose eventually. Look what happened to the Soviet Union. Look what has happened to, the Soviet, to Russia now. I think that is heading and like an express train towards a disaster. In terms of freedom of information, freedom of press, people want to know. You're not going to stop people finding out. In the second, the beginning of the, uh, the, just before the Second World War, when the Germans invaded um, uh, what remained of Czechoslovakia, the British Prime Minister, to his eternal shame, said, Czechoslovakia, this is a far off country of which we know nothing. 500 miles away. But that's because nobody could see it. Nobody had been there. A few people. Nobody knew. That's 1938. Now if you go to 1956, and the tanks rolled into Hungary, and the, there wasn't the kind of instant television there is now, people could see it. So we knew what was happening. And we knew that the Russians were mad to do it. And if anything destroyed the credibility of the Russians at that time, that was it. Think of 1968 when the tanks rolled into Prague. That we could see. It's not a country that we know nothing of. We could see it. Think of the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War was lost by the Americans because it was on television every night. The idiocy of bombing Iraq back to the Stone Age was shown because it was on television. And the reason we know Bush was a criminal is because of what he did. Bush won and Bush too. We could see it. So that's freedom of information. That's seeing what is happening. So I'm against any kind of censorship. Famously, in the uh, in the, the last great British war, um, which was the last great British war, which is when we went uh, to defend the Falkland Islands, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, who was in many ways completely mad, she tried to stop all television and, and uh, journalists from seeing what was happening. And for years she denied that the Belgrano, the famous uh, ship that was sunk uh, by a submarine and many, many people were killed, she said it was sailing towards the Falklands. And we knew that wasn't true. But she went on saying, lying to us that it was sailing towards the fog. That's why we had to sink it. Eventually, we were able to prove it was going in the other, it was going home. They'd had enough, they didn't want to fight, they'd go home. But Mrs. Thatcher, a good idea, sink the Belgrano. That was show. Stupid woman. But that's freedom of information. So the answer to your question about freedom is absolutely no censorship. Just be careful when it comes to children. Здравствуйте, Анастасия Гагашоу. Вы затронули очень интересную тему военной журналистики. И у меня такой вопрос. У Сьюзен Джекобсон есть короткометражный фильм, он называется «Одна сотая доля секунды». Или нет? Там, где журналистка получает премию за то, что сфотографировала мертвую девочку. Ну, скажем так, коротко. Как вы относитесь... Вот к, этой самой, к этому самому реальному кадру, к этой красоте или, скорее, даже эстетике смерти, боли, отчаяния какого-то с ваше отношение. Спасибо. I've got the point. I've got the point. It's a very interesting question. We all die. 
Hmm? Huh? From Rand, here. Oh. Oh, yeah. oh. oh sorry, I thought, I thought you were here. We all died. Bad news. <laughs> Bad news. Some sooner than others, since I'm four times as old as you. Although that's not so. It's not something that we want to admit. It's not something that we like. It's not something that we care about. But it will happen. We are naturally, therefore, very curious how it, how it happens. What happens? Now, I think in the West, I'm talking about Western Europe now, we've become very, uh, the word in English is squeamish. We don't want to know. We don't want to know. And it's interesting in Russia, for example, somebody dies, dead body, on the kitchen table, can't talk to the dead body, kiss the dead body goodnight, whatever, whatever, whatever. They have a much more... The most dead bodies I've ever seen, personally, were always in Russia, usually in churches. The coffins are left open, etc. Relatives and churches. We are very curious about what... Even if you're not religious, you're very curious about what happens. You go to sleep and don't wake up. Does it hurt? We don't know. We don't know. It's one of the great mysteries of our existence. And I think quite, we'd like to know. Part of us would like to know. Part of us don't want to know. Because I don't want to be talking to you because it's so interesting. If you see what I mean. But we want to know. I think if the person who is dying agrees to be filmed, that's fine. That's the important point. Uh, there are now famous cases. There was a film made, you know, in Switzerland there's this clinic called Dignitas. Uh, in England you are not allowed to uh, assist uh, with a suicide. Uh, it's, it's a big, big problem now in England. Mr. X, uh, he's in a wheelchair, he's in pain, he's, his life is horrible. He wants to die, to stop the pain. I am his brother. Uh, I can help him by giving him the pill uh, that would kill him, smother him, whatever. Take the, turn off the, uh, the life support machines. I then would be uh, uh, attacked for a uh, be murder. I would be a murderer. I'm a criminal. So there is now this uh, clinic in Switzerland called Dignitas where you can go uh, and they help you to die. And it's perfectly legal. And of course, it's terrifying. It's a terrifying idea. But somebody made a film about them, and the, all the people who you see in the film dying uh, gave permission. And the actual moment of death is quite horrifying in the film. Because you realize this is not play acting, this is the real thing. But it was fascinating to watch. Fascinating. Partly because there is a huge move in England now to stop it being made illegal. Stop me being a criminal for helping my brother who's in wheelchair, etc. Et so the aesthetics of it are complicated by the fact that you need to have the permission of the person who is dying. Or if the person is dead. There are, for example, there's this dreadful uh, drug ecstasy. And there was a very, very pretty girl uh, who died from an overdose of ecstasy pills. And her parents, who were, I mean, she was 16, I think, she just gone to a club, taking too many pills, died. And there were photographs of her in, in agony on the floor, I mean, dead, but her body all screwed up like this and her skirt up. I mean, horrible photographs. Her parents insisted that those photographs were published as a warning to other girls not to do anything. <laughs> so I think each case has to be considered separately. But I think the background to it is that we are very afraid of showing death, and we are very afraid of dying ourselves. But we have to come to terms with it, because it will happen to us, and we might as well know as much as we can. It's a very important aesthetic 
philosophical question, but I, I think I'm on the whole on the side of those who want to show it. If it's done with dignity. I mean, if it's a peep show, if it's pornography, then I'm totally against it. But if it's done with dignity, I think it's important part of human life. I mean, for example, when I first went, uh, when I first joined the BBC in 1966, I can't imagine seeing on live television a birth, you know, a baby coming out of your womb. I can't imagine that. That would have been horrific. You know, you'd see the face, uh, or you'd see the feet, but not an actual birth. Now we see it all the time. Are, are, we, are we a corrupt society because of it? No, of course not. You know, it's one thing that happens to us all. We are born. And I, I remember going to the birth of my three children. Most incredible experience of my whole life. Far better than making me feel. I was there. It was wonderful to see this. Come on, Rachel. Come on, Rachel. Come on, Rachel. Come on, Rachel. Я родила дитину, чоловік знімав на відео, і це було прекрасно. No, no, that, yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. I said, I didn't say terrible. I said it was wonderful. I said it was the most wonderful, did I say terrible? No, I said it was the most wonderful experience of my life. It's wonderful. This is part of human existence. I never said terrible. Uh, my name is Ira. I have a question. Um, do you want to make a film about uh, someone from famous Ukrainian person? This, yes. Uh, it's not a famous Ukrainian person, but I mean, I've been trying to persuade someone to find the money to make this film for a long, long time. If you take the little area, well, not little, it's a big area, uh, of southern Poland, south. Western Belarus, North Eastern Ukraine. That area, I know there's the borders, which is a problem, but that area there, that's an incredible crucible of European culture. Incredible. Um, Stravinsky came from there, or his family came from there, for example. Um, uh, one of the greatest of all English writers, although he's Polish, Joseph Conrad, came from that. Bartok came from that. And so on and so on and so on. It's an extraordinary mixture of cultures in that, which is now three different countries. That would make a wonderful film. So yes is the answer. Not a person, but this territory. You find me the money, I'll make the film. Is that a promise? Are you promising? Can I find you the money? <laughs> okay. It's a serious, I mean, it's a serious answer to a very important question. Well, is the budget 10 million or, two, or 200? No, I, I have a gut feeling of 250. <laughs> <laughs> I have to feed three small children. Good question. Tony, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for great lecture and sharing your experience. I want to thank our guest, Regisseur Tony Palmer. Thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. Ось. Я думаю, кожен з нас дізнався щось цікаве, міг задовольнити власне свою цікавість, кожен був свій шанс. І давайте подякуємо. І також подякуємо нашому перекладачу Олександру Білякову, який дві години синхронно перекладав цей.